Cubism was the matrix or main influence for most of the major pictorial and sculptural expression in the 20th century. It was one of the first main art movements to directly challenge traditional painting. This was because one of the main goals of the Cubist was to shake free of conventions, what Brock called La Fosse Tradition, or the false tradition that had governed Western paintings for the past five centuries. Cubism was founded in Paris in 1907 by Pablo Picasso and Georges Brock. Cubists abandoned sensual appeal of color and texture, subject matter, with emotional change and a play of light on form, movement, and atmosphere. Elements often associated with older art movements like Impressionism and Romanticism. Instead, Cubism analyzed, broke down, and reassembled objects into abstract forms. Essentially, Cubists reduced and fractured objects into geometric forms, then realigned them in a shallow reflex space. In Cubist painting, the object is painted from many different perspectives and angles, as if the object is viewed in a broken mirror. The strange new manner of depicting objects rendered Cubism as the first truly abstract art style. Picasso describes Cubism as a new language of painting, one that could show for dimensions, including the passage of time in a two-dimensional art form. In the beginning, Cubism was simply an attempt to revitalize Western art that had run its course. Picasso, Brock, Ledger, and Greece, the four main Cubist artists, were all based in the suburbs of college until World War I, so Cubism flourished in this tight-knit community. Cubism grew to be controversial as well as popular within the Paris art circles, and in 1911, the first organized showing of Cubists took place at Le Salon des Independentes in Paris. Cubism was founded in Paris by two young artists, Pablo Picasso, who is very well known nowadays, and Georges Braque, who is not as well known as Picasso. Although Picasso and Braque's stature in modern art's history is extremely different today, the invention of Cubism was such a joint effort between these two that they often had difficulty distinguishing each other's work. Brock described their relationship in founding Cubism as that of two mountaineers roped together, helping each other climb their way to the top toward success. People often say that Picasso and Brock did preliminary mathematical calculations before they translated their ideas onto the canvas, but this isn't true. They simply experimented. And through such experimentation, Cubism was formed. Picasso and Brock chose to experiment because they were tired of utilizing the traditional Western painting techniques that were championed by artists such as the Impressionists. So instead, they reverted back to the fundamental principles of art and began from the bottom up, adopting artistic techniques of more primitive people as well as more ancient people. Picasso in particular was tired because he was a child prodigy and he had already learned the techniques of Western art really easily from his father, who was an art teacher. So instead, he resorted to such experimentation and incorporated these non-Western influences into his art. This is also why Picasso frequently switched styles as soon as he considered the old one mastered, so that he could challenge himself. Spoiler, he eventually got tired with Cubism as well. But also, Picasso and Braque lived through a time where change was welcomed in terms of technology as well as artistic techniques. After the Industrial Revolution, people embraced new ideas. Cubism was not very well received when Picasso and Brock first exhibited paintings in the Cubist style. It drew heavy criticism, and even the famous Favre's painter Henri Matisse called Cubism the death of Western painting. Brock's first paintings were rejected by the Salon de Tum, one of the most prominent salons in Paris at the time, so he moved to the Salon des Independents, which was known for rebelling against traditional art. Here, Cubism flourished. Les Demoiselles de Vigne was Picasso's first masterpiece, and it brought about Cubism's popularity and because of its controversial use of savage techniques. The style is very unique because it looks almost brutal and violent because of its uh, dismemberment of the female body in the picture.
and it almost resembles uh, shattered glass of a broken mirror. But the unique thing about the picture is it seems to have a bit of space and holds volume, but it also looks like it's on one plane as well. This painting was also influenced by um, African masks, as you can see on the two women on the right, both of them uh, seeming to have African masks on their face, of course. Um, that's actually one of the things that uh, influenced Picasso and Cubism. Also, although this is um, one of Cubism's most famous paintings, and is said to be the first Cubist painting. It's not actually a Cubist painting. It's more uh, proto-Cubist works. The style in the painting is actually primitive primitivism, which was a precursor to Cubism, where artists borrow the visual forms from non-Western, more primitive people like the tribes in Central Africa and Oceania in the Pacific. More about the uh, painting is that initially it was very unliked and considered a loss for French painting because of the overwhelming use of art techniques native to what they considered the primitive and savage people of Africa. Uh, also, the Les Demoiselles de Vignon was also conceived as a narrative brothel scene, so Picasso had to change it to a vertical format and adopted a more discontinuous sense of space for the setting. So he removed the initial male visitors and reorientated the uh, woman to confront the viewer who was implicitly male. Now, the reason the picture is so uh, known and uh, controversial is because it represents a link in the development of cubism because the disruptive confrontational element in the painting contrasts with the true spirit of cubism which looked at the world from a detached realistic spirit nevertheless everything occurs in a single plane and like i said objects are positioned in a way that fa uh, facets enable the audience to see the space in the painting which came to be an important aspect in cubism now going at a more in-depth look like i said before the women on the top right have a rigid nose, a sharp tin, uh, chin, I mean, small oval mouth, and deleted ears, which are all characteristics of African masks. Also, some figures look radically different from the other figures. The figure on the far left has influence from ancient uh, Iberian art, uh, while the uh, two figures on the right have influences from African art. There is also an Egyptian influence demonstrated by pinched waisted figures and low relief treatments. Through this more primitive style, Picasso wanted to paint his subjects more directly with the uh, I mean without the clouding of excessive detail. Like I said, the space being really controversial uh, looks really flat. This is due to the fact that the woman and demoiselle are painted in straight lines and flat overlapping surfaces making the women seem weightless even though women in the far right uh, even though she's appearing to like look through a curtain in the back she is still on the same plane as the other four figures brock first visited picasso's studio in late 1907 where he saw the demoiselles de avignon and later, in 1909, Brock moved in with Picasso, and they collaborated closely in the early stages of Cubism. So, the painting you see here is The Viaduct of Les Stock by Georges Brock. It was painted in 1908, and it is Brock's first fully developed Cubist painting. When you first glance at Brock's Viaduct of Les Stock, you immediately feel like the painting is compressed as the bridge or the viaduct in the background seems to push the crowded houses in the foreground towards you. Brock achieves this compression by reducing the houses as well as the other objects in this painting to their geometric forms or the basic shapes that make up each individual object. There are numerous rectangles, triangles, 
prisms and semicircles that make up each individual object. For example, the rectangles make up the sides of the houses, while the triangular prisms make up the roofs of the houses. Also, one can view the semicircles between the supports of the viaduct in the background. Additionally, the continuity of the brush strokes and the shades of beige in the painting help remind you that this is a two-dimensional painting and that space does not exist as there's no depth to this painting. So the basic intention of Picasso and Brock when creating Cubist works was to recreate visual reality as completely as possible, but in a self-serving, non-imitative art form. So they didn't want to merely copy nature as they saw it onto the canvas. Instead of assuming that a work of art was an illusion of reality, like this directly copied painting of nature from nature itself, Cubism proposed that a work of art was a reality that represented the very process by which nature is transformed into art. Cubists don't care about the final product that shows nature, but instead they focus on the process by which nature becomes art as they perceive it. This very process of breaking up objects into their basic shapes and forms caused the critics of Brock and Picasso at the time to coin the term cubism. And these numerous fragmented shapes that an object is decomposed into in cubism are meant to exist and be seen simultaneously as elements arranged on a flat surface, thereby allowing these shapes to represent space independently and causing the painting to have more depth. Also, cubists use techniques such as overlapping to create multiple layers and allow the painting to have greater depth. Except for the joint influence of Cezanne and African sculpture, cubism was remarkably self-contained. Picasso and Brock developed their idea of cubism through the paintings of Paul Cezanne. Cezanne's influence on cubism and the works of Picasso and Brock is unparalleled. Picasso and Brock adopted Cezanne's technique of changing his viewpoint to better fuller expressions, forms, and volumes in space. Cezanne created the impression of solid, strong objects using geometric shapes and distorted perspective. Cezanne explained everything in nature is modeled on the sphere, cylinder, and the cone. As Cezanne used the cylinder, sphere, and the cone to portray different views of an object, Picasso and Brock adopted Cezanne's ideas and incorporated the use of the prism to achieve this goal. Picasso and Brock used Cezanne's photos as inspiration in many of their pieces. For example, Picasso and Brock's early painting, House on the Hill and the Viaduct of Lastock, respectively, which closely resemble Cezanne's Bibimus quarry. Their color palettes and faceting are remarkably similar in these three paintings. The spatial continuity of Picasso admired in Cezanne's work was treated in the house on the hill in terms of nearly monochromatic tilted facets that the fragment forms into a flow of light dispersing surfaces. Beginning in 1908 and continuing through the first few months of 1912, Brock and Picasso invented the first phase of cubism together. Painting in this style, which later came to be known as analytic cubism, Picasso and Brock's work became nearly monochrome, brown canvases of still lifes and figures. Analytic cubism was the first phase of cubism, and it was used mostly by Brock and Picasso. The other phase of cubism is called synthetic cubism, but we'll cover that later. Analytic cubism, also known as the hermetic cubism, is characterized by fragmented geometric shapes and the monochromatic use of color. Picasso and Brock began to use mostly shades gray, brown, black, and off-whites in their canvases because they wanted to differentiate planes from one another spatially, and strong color would have upset the spatial structure and perhaps violate reality. These paintings were abstract and it was often difficult to discern the subject of the painting. This was because Picasso believed that an artist's abstraction and distortion of reality could capture an alternate, more powerful reality. 
However, Picasso made sure this work wasn't too abstract, so he always retained a hint of the original object by creating a link between the reality of the object and the reality of its portrayal on the canvas. Analytical cubism was intended to appeal to intellect where forms were rigidly geometric and composition subtle and intricate. Portrait of Con Weiler was all painted by Picasso in 1910, and between 1909 and 1912, Picasso's cubist paintings progressed from larger to smaller shapes. The colors from or began to progress to shades of gray and tan, and from more to less identical subjects. This picture is perfect evidence for that because the top right hand portion of the painting is more or less brownish and very black, while the bottom and middle down to the right corner are black and gray with like shades of or hints of white. Now it may not seem like it because this picture is actually one of the more highly analytic cubist examples, um, but Conweiler was actually based off of um, Picasso's primary art dealer. The subject in Conweiler is hard to see clearly and the painting only consists of shades of gray and brown like I said earlier because, excuse me, um, in high analytic cubism distortion is greater and the color is um, less important so it's more neutral. You can also tell that this is highly analytic cubism because the geometric planes in this picture are particularly small. Also, the shapes are relatively transparent and luminous, causing them to reflect back upon themselves, and this gives the painting another layer of depth. Here is another analytic cubist work, but this time it was painted by Georges Braque. He painted it in 1910, and it is called Woman with Mandolin. You can tell that this piece is a work of analytic cubism because the subject is so fragmented and fractured like broken glass that you might have a difficult time seeing the subject or no clue at all what the subject is in this painting. While Picasso's cubism tended to be more linear, angular, more fragmented and immediate in presentation, and even sculptural in conception. Brock's cubism is more painterly, lyrical, smooth, and cohesive, as seen in Woman with Mandolin. For example, the borders of the various fragments in this piece are extremely light, and the fragments seem to blend in into one another. It's not rigid, in a sense. And they're not as confined as the fragments in Picasso's work, where you could clearly see the definite shape of the fragment. In Brock's Woman with Mandolin, the tightly woven network of geometric shapes help to outline a figure of the woman. I know it's really hard to see, but if you look closely, you can see the whole figure of the woman in the center, and she's like the title says, holding a mandolin, which is like a tiny guitar. So if you still can't see the woman in the painting, let me help show you. So this is the face of the woman in the top center of the painting. And as you can see here, she's pretty much emotionless. And this is because cubism did not emphasize emotion as much because they believed that this detracted from the main purpose of cubism, which is analytic cubism, is to demonstrate the decomposition or fragmentation of the subject. And emotion would just conflict with this purpose. And here are arms which are holding the mandolin. And finally, here is the mandolin itself. And the dark circle is the opening of the mandolin, like the hole in a guitar. Here is yet another work of analytic cubism, and this time it's by Picasso. He painted uh, this painting in 1911, and 
the beginning of 1912. He finished it, and it is called Maja Lee. Picasso's high analytic cubism became more abstract after the portraits of his friends like Conweller, as the planes, lines, shading, and space no longer set off the subject. Maja Lee is as abstract as Picasso's work ever became. If I asked you to tell me the subject of the painting right now, most of you couldn't answer me what the subject is or where it's located in the painting upon your first impression of Maja Lee. On one hand, Picasso and Brock abstracted the works to the point where their works were reduced to a series of overlapping planes, like you see in Maja Lee. And here they found themselves losing touch with the reality, so they resorted back to painting more realistic pictures and incorporating elements of reality into these pictures. Yet, on the other hand, the more Picasso and Braque incorporated such elements of reality into their picture, the more they found that the spatial structure in, this paint, in their paintings became clouded by unnecessary descriptive detail of shading and the complexities of light within that painting. So, Picasso and Brock went back and forth between abstraction and tangible reality. The only clue that Picasso gives of the subject in this painting is the subtitle Majali at the center of the bottom of the painting and Manjali translates from French into English to my pretty or my beautiful so hopefully the outline on the right helps you see the woman in Manjali better and the only feature feature that's easily recognizable in the actual painting of Manjali is her left arm, which is bent at the elbow in the center right of the painting. In 1912, Picasso and Braque moved from analytical cubism to the other style of cubism, synthetic cubism. Synthetic cubism is characterized by the increased use of color compared to the dull shades of brown in analytic cubism, simpler forms and lines, and the introduction of different materials such as cloth and typically used techniques like collage. It is usually more distinguishable than analytic cubism. Moving on to a picture, finally, by Brock, um, Fruit Dish and a Glass, or Fruit Dish and Glass, painted in 1912. This uh, painting uses the technique which Brock uh, invented, and it's called Paper Collet. Paper collet actually translates into pasted paper, which is the layering of shapes of paper, some for the background and others to make objects and shadows. In this sculpture, he glued pieces of wallpaper to the support and charcoal lines. He also bought paper with a wood grain pattern on it, so if you turn your head to the side, it appears that the brown sections of the wallpaper are really the sides of a table. Due to this fact, the um, sculpture actually becomes more realistic. So, through this, I mean, Brock also included the words bar and ale on the top right and bottom left respectively. So this text gives clues to the viewers about the setting of this piece. The painting is showing a section of a bar and a fruit dish on the top center, which is filled with grapes and pears, as well as the glass which is on the bottom right. So essentially, this piece is very influential through the fact of it using paper collet, so that his pieces would add texture, or the, excuse me, the technique would add texture to his pieces. A uh, still life with chair caning was made by Picasso also in 1912, just like uh, Brock's paper collet piece. This was the result of Picasso experimenting with um, collage. Also kind of making the uh, piece 3D-like, 
collages turn two-dimensional paper into three-dimensional expressions. Now, in this piece, Still Life, with chair caning, uh, Picasso made a collage with rope, letters cut from a newspaper, and a piece of loin or oil cloth printed to look like chair caning. Now, believe it or not, the rope border of this piece is actually real rope. And only the top part and the right part of this piece is actually painted. The rest is oil cloth, which is like the material used in tablecloths or the cloth people used to uh, line their shelves. The oil cloth Picasso used, he actually, with a drawing of a chair on it, so he cut out the specific section of the oil cloth, depicting the chair caning on the back seat of the chair. This painting is actually an example of synthetic cubism. Um, synthetic cubism uses an object and uses the perspectives from multiple angles instead of the usual one. You can see the aspects of synthetic cubism in this uh, collage in the wine glass on the top center. You can see both the top view and the side view of the glass. You can see the letters J-O-U and text that appears in synthetic cubist works is extremely important because for one example Picasso was known to utilize stencil lettering and print by which he exploited puns, hidden meanings, and double entendres in his work. The J-O-U was actually a reference to the French word game or to play and is also a new or sorry excuse me a reference to the newspaper as J-O-U uh, that actually means that J-O-U are the first three letters of the French word for newspaper or journal. Also adding to the list that Picasso used the letterings and prints for, he also used them um, to reference tense pre-war politics, social matters, and artistic matters as well. This painting is a, I mean, collage is very controversial because... Collage and paper collet offered a new method of dealing with pictorial language and a new way of suggesting space as well. Now, when we say analytic and synthetic cubism to describe pieces of work the artist put together, sure, they do have their own quote-unquote special characteristics that set them apart, but in reality, they're just uh, rigid classifications. Many paintings uh, in the Cubism era, such as the Three Musicians, cannot be classified as either analytical or synthetic Cubism because they just contain both of the elements. Picasso painted uh, Three Musicians as if he had cut out colored and glued the designs onto the surface. So as you can see in the picture of Three Musicians, um, unlike most analytic Cubist paintings, the subjects aren't exactly well defined it looks as if there's just uh cats i guess playing instruments but it does um seem to be a quite detailed picture which is a sort of characteristic of analytic cubism but also it seems like i said it to be a collage of some sort because he painted it that way so that is certainly a well-known characteristic of uh, synthetic cubism. We are moving on to the third most important cubist after Picasso and Braque respectively, and his name is Fernand Leger. Leger was a friend of Picasso and Braque's, and he also lived close by in a, in a nearby suburb in Paris, and he was in the art circles in Paris, where he grasped onto Cubism, which was just taking hold of Paris at that time. Ledger deferred in style with Picasso and Braque regarding Cubism, as he gave light a more active role, and he also used a wider range of colors, especially the primary colors, in some of the planes in his works. Come compared to the shades of brown and gray that typically made up Picasso and Braque's palette. Ledger 
was extremely concerned with representing a known reality or known subject in his early Cubist works. And he said that pictorial contrasts, such as complementary colors, lines, and forms, were the structural basis in his works. Fernand Ledger's paintings are known for combining strong, simple shapes and pure primary colors. How, however, Ledger's experience in World War I had a great impact on his future paintings. He was inspired by the new technology, especially the engineering of the weaponry, such as the tanks and the airplanes, and they caused him to incorporate this imagery in his later works in his career. But we will cover that soon. Let's begin with one of Fernand Ledger's most famous works, as well as one of his earliest works in Cubism. Painted in 1910, this work is called Nudes in the Forest. As you can see, Fernand Ledger embraced the same Cubist ideals pioneered by Georges Braque and Pablo Picasso regarding the breaking up of objects into their base simple geometric forms. However, unlike in the works of Picasso and Braque, you can see more cylindrical forms than the typical rectangular forms that we associate with cubism. As we zoom in on one of the women here, you can see that this woman has been joined together out of simple blocks and cylinders, very similar to a robot. And the implied movements of her arm have both a human-like quality as well as a machine-like automatic quality to them. Ledger's Nudes in the Forest was often called Tubist, like a tube, because it consisted of cylindrical forms instead of prisms. And this painting by Ledger is a personal form of cubism and he was heavily criticized for it because the critics didn't like the fact that he emphasized these cylindrical forms instead of the quote-unquote traditional cubist cubes and prismic forms that Picasso and Braque made famous. Nevertheless the machine-like quality of his subjects due to these cylindrical forms became more prominent in his later works, which we will cover really soon. This painting that we see here is called Exit the Ballet Russes, and it was painted by Fernand Ledger in 1914. And as you can see here, it's pretty abstract. And when Ledger chose to be abstract, and paint in a style like he painted Exit the Ballet Russes, he was often more abstract than Picasso and Braque ever were. Only the white faces on the black and white lozenges at the upper left and the lower right give away the subject of the piece, and those are the black and white lozenges are supposed to be the faces of the ballet figures. You might ask yourself why many of the subjects in Ledger's paintings resemble robots. And once again, this is because while Ledger was at the front during World War I, he was deeply affected by the beauty of modern engineering. Fernand Ledger was fascinated with the engineering especially that of the new weaponry like the tanks and the airplane bombers, which were just being introduced into modern warfare. And he saw these, this, this new technology frequently on the fronts in the First World War. 
Also, Ledger believed that the breaking up of objects into these cylindrical tubular forms represented the disintegration in the quality of life, as well as the general dissonance or disharmony in life that accompanied modern industrialized society. Although industrialization brought along a lot of positives, such as the new ideas and new technology, which made life easier, it also had many negative consequences. People had to work longer hours in their jobs, and there was a lot more pollution caused from you know, the multiple factories. And Ledger identified both these pros and cons in his paintings. So Ledger's paintings that consisted of these tubular and machine-like forms came to be known as his mechanical period. And they people started to say he painted in a style called mechanical cubism. And his early experience as an architectural draftsman and his friendship with the famous architect Le Corbusier gave him the practical experience with machinery and engineering which you can see that translated into his mechanical cubist works later on. This is one example of Ledger's mechanical cubism. Ledger painted it in 1918, and it is called Propellers. Propellers was supposedly painted after Marcel Duchamp challenged Fernand Ledger to paint a propeller better than it was in real life after both of them saw a propeller at a fair in France. Propellers was Fernand Ledger's response to Duchamp's challenge, and Ledger explained that the manufacture object is clean and precise, beautiful in itself, the most terrible competition that art an artist has ever been subject to. So one of the main reasons Ledger painted in the mechanical cubist style is to show that art could compete with machines and it wouldn't be made obsolete due to this new technology in the future. This is another example of mechanical cubism. It is called the card players and Ledger painted it in 1917. As you can see, once again, the figures have an automaton or robot-like look due to Ledger breaking them down into their cylindrical forms. This is yet another example of mechanical cubism. Ledger painted the smoker, as it is called, in 1914. Uh, as you can see, this the figure in the painting is broken down into the typical cylindrical forms that characterizes mechanical cubism. And the smoker's face in particular is at the top of the composition as the smoke floats into the upper left corner. corner. Smoke and smokers for Ledger are very important themes in his paintings. Smoke was a symbol of modern industrial society, since factories emitting smoke is closely associated with industrialization and the Industrial Revolution. And the smokers, in particular, were the symbols of the working class who Ledger closely associated with and believed that they were hard workers and the backbone of this modern industrial society. Juan Grease, uh, what, a, what a guy. I'm just kidding. Uh, Grease was good friends with Ledger and Brock, and he was also the other cubist in the confined artistic circles of uh, Paris. And um, a little background is uh, Greece regarded Picasso as a teacher. However, 
uh, Picasso dismissed Greece, which is kind of weird. Uh, Greece differed from Picasso and Brock. He was an artist that valued for the depth and consistency of his approach rather than an innovator. And um, unlike Picasso and Brock, Greece painted with bright, harmonious colors like his friend Matisse, who was a actually a fauvist known for uh, his extravagant use of color. Uh, in comparison with the analytic cubism of Brock and Picasso, the works of Greece were more severe and lucid in that it was easier to see the subject because he desired to emphasize the material identity of the art object and to convey the subject matter more clearly than them. A portrait of Picasso was painted by Greece in 1912. And it, it, it's an example of an analytic cubist work, uh, and an example of cubism being used to paint portraits. Here, as you look at the picture, you can see that the subject is clearly Picasso, but he's disorientated. So, it's uh, easily seen compared to the subjects in Woman with Mandolin and Maholier. It's uh, pretty simple to see the subject of Picasso, because the Geometric forms that are used to compose his figure in the painting are quite large. Another thing about the painting is that um, there's not much depth because the forms are opaque and not transparent. So due to this, we can't see behind them like we could in Picasso's portrait of Conweiler or Brock's woman with mandolin. This causes Picasso to look um, more, more flat in P Portrait of Picasso. And as we uh, look at the picture, we can see only like three shades of colors, excluding the ones on the palette he's holding are really used. Violin and Checkerboard was painted by Juan Gris as well in 1913. A, uh, a little background, after 1913, Juan Gris transitioned from uh, doing analytic cubism to synthetic cubism, where he produced uh, this famous work of art. One of the first things you can see in a violin and checkerboard is the vibrant use of color. Instead of the boring uh, usual browns and grays that were used so that we can focus on the painting more, or rather the uh, meaning, so to say, Greece uh, also used green, bright blue, orange, and yellow in this canvas. Such use of color was very rare to see, or differentiated, shall I say, from the works of Picasso and Brock. Another important aspect of cubism seen in this painting is that the painting is of an object seen from multiple perspectives or angles. Here, the, there are two images of a violin. We know that these two images are of the same object because the tile of the piece is violin and checkerboard not violins and checkerboard. I guess the uh, checkerboard is kind of seen from multiple per uh, perspectives as well because it's on the bottom center and it blends into the blue quilt like rectangles. Yeah, I guess it, it's not really multiple perspectives rather than they did differing from reality. Just like Brock did in fruit dish and glass, Juan Gris also used wood grain wallpaper this use of wallpaper in the painting characterizes this as a, a work of synthetic cubism as well. Last but not least, teacups painted by Juan Gris in 1914. This is a phenomenal piece made by Gris because uh, the work teacups consists of almost all collaged elements like wallpaper patterns, newspaper, and other kinds of paper. and only the black and white areas seen on this uh, work of art are directly painted. You can see, um, if you look at the top center, the newspaper. This is real newspaper that Greece put on his work. If you look at the brown section, this represents the table on which a newspaper, a pipe, and the teacups, the subject of this painting, rest on. A little more background information on Juan Gris, uh, he said that cubism was purely descriptive and analytical, for the only relationship that existed was that between the intellect of the painter and the objects, there was really never 
or there was practically never any relationship between the objects themselves and the pieces. Uh, also, when World War I was declared, Greece was one of the few Cubist painters able to continue his works. However, uh, unfortunately, Greece died at the age of 40, so he did not produce that many works compared to Pablo Picasso or Fernand Ledger. After World War I, Cubism was largely dispersed. However, Ledger was one of the few artists to paint in the Cubist style, as Picasso and Braque moved on to other styles of art and Greece died. However, Picasso influenced many of the other artists to join the Cubism movement, including Albert Glaces, Fernand Ledger, and Jean Metzinger. Nevertheless, Cubism remains one of the first and most influential of all movements in the 20th century art. In fact, Picasso is now considered one of the fathers of modern art. Before Cubism, painters found many ways to depict external reality under the flat canvas. Cubist artwork found a new way to depict reality by breaking up the space into its simplest form and showing more than one view of an object in the same frame. Cubism also influenced modern architecture. Famous architect Le Corbusier adopted Cubist aesthetic in his building. Influenced by synthetic cubism, artists brought real objects like soup cans and stuffed fabric french fries into the work which became known as pop art. When Picasso introduced outside materials that both present themselves and represent something else, he further changed traditional art as he incorporated new meanings in his work. Cubism introduced collage into paintings also. Futurism in Italy was heavily influenced by Leisure's mechanical cubism. Also, the art movements of constructivism in the Soviet Union and neoplasticism in the Netherlands were inspired by Leisure's mechanical cubism. Duchamp and Picabia put cubism behind them to create the first work of Dadaism. New Descending Staircase No. 2 by the legendary Marcel Duchamp, that you all know very well, commonly classified as a cubo-futurist work. Robert Delany incorporated the prismatic color of Cezanne, which the cubists generally neglected, to form the art movement of Orphism. Cubism influenced many other art, different art movements such as Vortism, Suprematism, Purism, and Expressionism. As Picasso once said, Cubism has tangible goals. We see it only as a means of expressing what we perceive with the eye and spirit, while utilizing all the possibilities that lie within natural drawing and color. That became a source of unexpected joy for us, a font of discoveries.